Welcome, friends and fiends of the pod. I'm your host, film critic and comedian Nate Wyckoff, reminding you to like, subscribe, and go to cultandclassicfilms.com, where you can purchase exclusive cult ultra-low-budget films from us. And you can also subscribe and have them delivered monthly at a big discount to your door every month. So don't miss out on that. And unlike Roddy Rowdy Piper here in They Live, you don't need special glasses to see these deals. All right, so please, thank you, and enjoy the show. Classic. <laughs> Welcome, friends and fiends of the pod, to another episode of Cult and Classic Films Podcast. I'm your host, film critic and comedian, Nate Wyckoff. You can catch me uh, performing at Flappers in Burbank, California on uh, November 6th. And which, by the way, I don't know why I'm telling you that, because it will be passed before you uh, actually hear this episode. So you can also catch me, I believe, on the 16th or 17th in Palm Desert, California at the River uh, storefront. So that'll be fun, too. You can catch me somewhere. Uh, so for this episode, it's part two of our Priests in Peril double feature. Last week, uh, Mandy Longley and I, who is here again today, uh, one of our resident critics, along with Greg Johnson, we talked about Exorcist to the Heretic from 1977 with Linda Blair and uh, it and Richard Burton, all these big stars, and how much of a train wreck it was. And I will say this yet again. I said it last week, but in case you're not listening, uh, I, I've I've talked to some other people who disagree. But Exorcist, the Exorcist believer, made the Exorcist two a much better movie because Believer was terrible in my opinion, and the first setup was fine and then the rest of the movie was just god awful terrible and so looking back i was like oh the exorcist 2 actually was not as bad you know if you perhaps took out the exorcist and and the and the repeated characters and put in a new front piece to it it might have been a fun little cult favorite but uh it was problematic it was a mess so this week we're talking about its cultish counterpart velocipaster from 2018. This is actually a pretty well-known uh, cult film as far as modern cult films go, uh, heavily because it was the picked people up. People I in... work with have watched this. Yes. Like when I mentioned it, they're like, "Oh yeah, like, we know that movie." And there's a and there's a reason. And the, probably the biggest thing that helped it is Amazon Prime picked it up and promoted it quite a bit uh, in the beginning, and that was a big, you know, that's a big driver, especially because at the time Amazon Prime was really pushing to be a competitor alongside uh you know netflix and hulu and um pre several of the other streaming services now so that was a big drive also uh we'll, we'll get into it but i think this movie is probably more accessible for a lot of people who aren't as familiar with dodgy cult films um but it, i really enjoy this movie so i'm glad we're here to talk about it and i'm glad uh thank you to mandy longley for insisting for a very long time that we do this film uh, which I uh, resisted for no reason other than uh, there were so many other ones already on the list. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick synopsis, and it's going to be quick because I can't possibly tell you what actually happens scene to scene because this is a lot of weirdness. Uh, a, a priest waves to his parents, and as they get in their vehicle outside of the church, it blows up, and they die and the priest uh, falls to his knees, and he has a crisis of faith, and his his priestly mentor tells him to uh, go on a walkabout, essentially wander the world. So he goes to China, uh, which looks suspiciously like, I don't know, maybe a, a, a Midwestern or East Coast forest somewhere. And uh, he is finding himself and then comes across a young Chinese woman uh, who, or someone playing a Chinese woman who is shot with an arrow. And this woman, as she dies, hands him this dinosaur uh, tooth and says something that he doesn't understand. And then says in English, cause that makes sense. Uh, something dragon warrior, or something along those lines. Anyway, this claw causes him to turn into a were velociraptor. And uh, he can somewhat control it, but he turns into it and then he gets hungry and eats people. And so he runs into a uh, prostitute who he befriends and eventually they become uh, more than friends. But she convinces him to use his velociraptor powers to kill uh, bad people in the world. So he does that. His mentor does not like it. He gives up the priesthood. And then the people that caused this whole conspiracy uh, 
because they want to spread Christianity. Very strange. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. I, I'm not sure I followed the logic, but uh, uh, they're run by a group of ninjas. And so it is uh, Velo the Velasa pastor plus his uh, lovely young girlfriend at that point against ninjas. And uh, that is that is the deal because uh, they want the Velasa raptor claw thingy. All right. I think that's it. Uh, it does have a happy ending of sorts. And uh, I, this movie really kind of blew me away. It hits a huge number of boxes for me as far as what kind of madness I want in my movies. So let's start. Uh, Mandy, you are the one that really, really drove for this movie. What was your expectation? And what did you actually get now that you have seen it and we've talked about it? Oh, man, I... I mean, like, even though I'd seen the preview, I guess, I don't know if it just blew my mind completely. I, I, I didn't quite know what I was getting into. Uh, I seemed to think, like, maybe he would be permanently turned into a lost raptor, or there would be, I don't know, a lot of lost raptors, or he was going to time travel, or, like, something. Like, I don't know, like, Daisy Durkin's. Right with yeah, like yeah. all of the dinosaurs and the wrestlers, like some shenanigans. I wasn't expecting him to be able to partially turn into a Velociraptor, or completely turn into one, and then turn back, or only have his hands turn like yeah, transform parts, and, like, parts of him. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely wasn't expecting the ninjas. I don't know why I wasn't expecting the ninjas, but I wasn't. Um, but I was expecting it to be just a ridiculous bunch of shenanigans loosely tied together to make a movie and that's what we got and it was fantastic yeah interestingly enough i actually kind of i kind of feel like i was expecting less coherence in this movie based on many of the other uh, uh, films and it's it sort of actually for the most part it does go you know a to b to c all the way to z <laughs> although the ending does get just banana sandwich as i like to say uh, i think perhaps i was thrown off by the the goofball like hyper you know photoshopped cover featuring like this raptor monster leaning over like a, a a bunch of ninjas with a random i won't say clip art but a stock image pastor like sitting in front because it's very much the kind of thing that uh wild are releasing and other releasing parties do to kind of grab people in like you see them on racks at say a walmart um you know in the in the cheap bins and they certainly have done it with several movies we've covered uh for example shark exorcist is a, is a really perfect example of that in fact it's very similar in composition to the cover for the veloc pastor but actually yeah it, it's a movie it's sort of it struck me as like it's a spoof but it's closer to like a, an old school spoof like maybe repossessed or something you know uh, an early uh, Leslie Nielsen one where there's still more of a plot and it's less skit based compared to like say a scary story or something anyway Greg uh you had not seen this movie before correct what uh, was your is... what was your take on it um I loved it um I, I I I had I had some big hopes um my my partner had seen it and um she was like it's really good it's really good she wanted to watch it with me but it just didn't quite work out um and so I was kind of like, okay, like Nate picked this. So and this is the cult film. This is very much the cult film. So I'm ready for some YouTube Janice.click shenanigans here. <laughs> and like, I, I feel like this movie, I don't know whether it was, they just had access to some real like talent. They clearly had good writers. Like you said, this is a lot more cohesive than it needed to be. It's well produced. Yeah. Like I think that was the biggest thing is it felt like, wow, like, Someone had a vision, and that vision was good. Like, it was like, it, it didn't feel like a passion project, even though it clearly was. It was just, right. it was, it was wild to see something this kind of idiotic on paper <laughs> make this much sense and work this well. And, like, we're talking about the movie poster here with, yeah, we got, like, like the rafter fucking in the, the priest guard. We have the priest, like, kind of half changed. We have the ninjas. All this was in the movie, yeah. and it and it looked pretty much like this. Obviously, some embellishment for a poster, 
But like, when was the last time that we watched a cult film and we were like, the movie poster, that's it. Like, that's that's what probably, happened. Probably Janice.click's uh, Attack of the Scarecrow from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I was... I was I was actually like it's only an hour and I would have been down for another 30 minutes which I don't think I've ever said. So I, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, so it, it, this is interesting because oftentimes when we see these cult movies um they are a, a freshman effort, right? They're the the first real feature length film. Um in this case it's not. Um Brendan Steer made this movie. Um he was young when he made it. Supposedly it was started in film school. I'm not I haven't really found anything for sure supporting on that but uh it is it's not his first film he he did a film uh i believe it was called animosity uh that there was a feature and it was a serious horror thriller and it is and he did several other you know writing projects before then as well directing projects so he'd done features before and it really does show because this feature it's it's a shot like a professional movie. And we should say too, this is a cult movie. This is a very independent film, but it's it costs almost 50 grand to make. So while that seems in the world of of studio cinema, that's the equivalent of like a five dollar bill you drop on the ground, probably a one dollar bill. But in the world of independent and and cult cinema, that's actually a hefty sum. Like you you should have decent camera, uh, audio, et cetera, because you know, you're actually using real money. People are getting paid, God willing. Uh, you you said it. 50 grand? Yeah. I Googled it really quick. Mad Max famously this like, oh, like low, no budget, 550 grand or right. 350. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's a good way to put in perspective that mm -hmm. this is not that far. Like that $300,000 is a lot of money, right. but like this is bordering on like you could have put this in a theater and it, yeah. You know, and I, I believe I'm sure it played. In fact, I know it played at some, you know, uh, festivals and things as as it should have. And it, it's one of those cases where we need to remind ourselves independent cinema does not mean no budget cinema. Right. You can have an independent film that's, you know, that, that costs just as much as Avengers. You probably won't, but you could. And the reason is, is because it's considered an independent film if it's made outside of the big studio system. No, so here at Colton Classic Films uh, film releasing, we tend to focus on uh, rare or really ultra low budget films, you know, DIY films, like the stuff we talked about with Adam Thorne or from Mark Mackner. Man, you mentioned Daisy Durkins, uh, and of course, who has just released uh, a new, uh, a re-release of double feature of his. You can check it out at coltonclassicfilms.com. And those are like no budget films. Like I believe the... And even then you have levels, right? Adam Thorne makes his movies primarily with stuff, as he says, he can find at the dollar store and stuff everybody already has, right? And then you get someone like Mark Mackner, who his uh, Half-Life Horror from Hell is a very, very low budget uh, feature, and yet it was about five grand. So you get different levels, even on the ultra low budget scale. And so Velocipaster at like 40 to 50,000, uh, give or take, I think I also saw somewhere like 35,000, it's only Brendan Steer probably knows. Uh, it is one of those cases where those mean very different things. So you have to get into the nitty gritty if you really want to understand how how much money was put in to make something look either good or bad. So the loss of pastor, we've talked, we, we all liked this movie, I think. Um, uh, and I wasn't really sure that I would. And that's totally okay. I love cult movies. But again, it looked like some cult movies that I have not loved and some that I have. I'm thinking specifically of a, was it Bride of Bigfoot or Bigfoot's Bride that we watched somewhat recently from Wild Eye Releasing. I'm not saying it wasn't worth yeah, watching. I yeah, I'm just saying that, you know, but the big highlight for me was watching Bigfoot catch a woman's pee pee in his hand and smell it. That is, that was the best moment of that movie and it happened relatively early. Oh, it, so It did, you know, like no reason to watch the rest of the film. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a little disappointing. I was expecting at least, you know, they could have, yeah, they could have replayed that like several times and, and, built up some screen time bigfoot reminiscing <laughs> man that was a great time uh yeah so <laughs> so brendan steer directed this and we have uh some 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 family involved as well i believe uh the 
Father Stewart, who is uh, Doug's, the lead's character, uh, is is in it. Uh, Father Stewart, played by Daniel Steer, related, I assume, to the director. Greg Cohen plays Doug, the lead. And um, we have uh, Carol is the the prostitute or, or, or sex worker, uh, played by Alyssa Kempinski. And I, something that was really cool is, Greg mentioned it, there's some good acting in this. Um, there's actually one scene in particular. It's like the romance scene where they're finally going to make love in like, you know, one of their, I think it's her because he lives at the at the uh, church, I assume, or in the vest somewhere over there. But she's got an apartment, kind of a nice looking apartment for being someone who is is not that sex workers can't make money, but she's not portrayed as one that makes money. But she's and, also what pre med, pre law. Yeah, pre med, pre law. As we <laughs> yeah. learn, <laughs> as we <laughs> learn. Um, yeah. And but they have like there's actually like a really good moment that's a serious film moment in there when they're talking and it's like this connection between them and then of course at some point it does have like a ridiculous line in there but they play it straight these people do not break um from playing it straight and so the ridiculousness of it is it's very much uh it's very much will ferrell in that he he 100 he's a good comedic actor because he 100 commits and these characters 100 percent committed you know like they do not break no one really laughs um the lead is so stoic and serious in all everything he does even when his lines are plain stupid like um don't you know stay away from me harlot uh stay away from me you know woman of sin whore of babylon like it's just <laughs> it's it's stupid and yet it's he plays it like it's it's real it, like it's the best most powerful dialogue in the world uh and i think he deserves a lot of credit for that we get a lot of sort of common comedic devices in this movie but they work because they're timed correctly for example uh we see early on when the car his parents die in the car explosion we he looks at it and we get a scene missing uh title <laughs> card and this has been done before. In fact, it's done in, in our recent release from Mark Mackner. I believe Half-Life Horror from Hell on that disc does that at least once. The difference here to take it to like the next level is that it's not just they put a scene missing to cover up the fact that they didn't do a special effect. It It's, it's referred to several times in that scene. Like Doug's, the character of Doug is horrified and blown backwards and then he's staring at it and then it cuts back to the scene missing as though we're watching the actual movie, as though the special effects are supposed to be inserted, and then back to him still reacting. Like, it's just, they played it intelligently. The movie uh, said, okay, this is this is the scene, even though it's the scene missing. This is the scene. And that was Wait. a smart way to do it. I think I think it's worth noting that like when you say scene missing, we're not talking about like a title card or a placard that just says that. We're talking about a shot of the street where the car was, <laughs> and then like like text art that just says like 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 I think specifically it was like v, like car on fire VFX. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's almost like uh, yeah, it's almost like taking like the meme memetic generation to like its nth degree like in 300 years this will be cinema it will just be like uh you know just just static images or like adult swim slightly animated backgrounds or or, or looping video with some sort of text indicator or symbols uh it's played well. You know, I th I think I would assume both of you have been to like an early movie screener before. Yeah. It reminded me a lot of that especially for like um, like an animated film where a lot of it is like they're like like it's like storyboard right. or it's like a, a half animation and you have all the dialogue going over right. it <laughs> that's totally true uh it does have that vibe because it, it literally yeah it literally looks like a placeholder that they would have slammed in there during editing to get that post-production thing and except that it isn't just a title card it is actual footage of the street um so th that's, again, that's a case of a frequently used comedic device, but it's used very well. Um, we have a lot of the other things like comedic misdirects. Um, but what kind of stunned me is watching it from the beginning and seeing that, because it's that's very much like the opening of the movie. 
seeing that and then expecting that we wouldn't actually get special effects because you know they opened with a big one that they don't have but there's actually some good like monster gore effects in there they're not overused but there's like sword damage um there are dinosaur claws like tearing into a a, a, a villain's neck um it is how about the wife dying in the war flashback Oh my god, <laughs> that is insane. Yes, there is a war, which by the way, the war flashback, we'll talk about that further in a second. But yes, it's a shock. It's a it's a spoiler alert ahead, but it's a shock moment and someone explodes from a landmine and it's just it's just an eruption of of gore and the other characters. I love that the character who's most affected by it, you know, has the stoic like frozen like not even stoic, but like frozen in just complete unacceptance of reality at that point standing there but the people behind him just say just comment on it as though it was you know somebody's you know dropping their groceries like those landmines or something and then they just go about their business oh i don't think we can help her she's too far gone well, she's <laughs> fucking goo and viscera There's covering no this guy you are just like and and it, what's so here's here's something about the flashback is it's a flashback that we know the character doing it, who, by the way, is like a, a, a mature man. And to be younger, he's just like put in a wig and a helmet. And that's him younger, which I always appreciate. And um, the, the war flashback, it seems like it's supposed to introduce like how this priest knows this like occult fanboy that they're introducing him to. But and it's the same actor, but they don't actually they don't actually connect how he's there because in the war flashback that character dies right and then in the current time the character's alive is that supposed to be the same guy i think it is you know i wasn't sure i wasn't um, either i was so confused the war flashback felt like all the war flashbacks in the movie airplane where i'm like what's the bit like we're right. not we, there's not actually like shit to be gained we're just here for a bit Okay, so I'm looking, they're not, and this is bad, they're not the same person. But again, it's hard to tell for me because Altair is the occult guy. He is played by uh, Aurelio Voltaire, and he's got, you know, like, facial hair, and, like, he's wearing mascara, and the whole, like, nine yards of, like, Chris Angel. And then the war buddy Ali in the flashback, which Ali is kind of close to Altair, is played by David Sokol. And I was trying to make the connection because the actual, like, the the trigger for the flashback is like father stewart like saying i hadn't basically like i hadn't seen altair in years or whatever uh and then he goes to the flashback and i'm like well what did that have to do with altair if that's not altair and if that's altair he died in the flashback what's happening i still don't know what happened with that um but it has such a punchline with the trip mine scene <laughs> that i didn't really care uh i just you know it's uh it was wild and and it's it's again it was funny and we haven't even talked about i think the next thing since we're talking about special effects is we need to talk about the actual velociraptor himself uh, or itself because it is it it is probably the thing that made me the most happy in the entire movie was seeing this movie that is well produced uh well acted everybody staying in character despite the insanity of the of the plot and dialogue and the suit is like a cool um, art project, like a really nice art project because it's very similar. It's like a do it your not even a wish.com. It's a do it yourself T-Rex costume, those popular T-Rex costumes now that, you know, people bounce around in all the time at, at parties and on on the TikToks and all the children's things. Uh, I'm just getting more, more on TikTok. So it's really fun, but it's clearly like handmade. And it is not realistic. For example, the cover of this movie, as you said, Greg, all the elements are accurate to the movie. The actual items on the cover are not. Um, the, the, the Velociraptor is someone in like a, a bumbling suit with with like teeth. And I, uh, supposedly, Brendan Steer had had this costume for a long time since high school sitting in his basement because they made it for a theater show in high school. And the di the director of the show or, or one of the one of the school staff said that it would make it too violent, so they couldn't use it. So he pulled it out for this, um, and it's it's a delight. And he does a really good again, good directing, good choices. 
he doesn't show you the raptor fully really until the end fight scene when the raptor is actually surrounded by several ninja we see bits and pieces we see it at night in a park um we see the hands uh, of the raptor peeking through we see like close-ups of someone you know with the mouth over it chewing on. but we don't actually see how sort of goofy the costume is in its full glory until he's fighting the ninjas in the climactic battle uh which has some pretty great scenes as well i think that that's it's it's not only wise from from the concept of like don't give too much away right away, but it also adds this extra level of joke because it's a reveal that is comical. You've watched a movie that frankly has really well done production values. And then I'm not saying that that a normal person could make a Velociraptor costume this cool, but it also is not Stan Winston Studios, right? It's it's closer to something that you would see somebody bring to a Halloween party and be like, no way, that is really cool. That is really good. That's closer to what it is. Uh, and so it's just really nice to see it. And when you see it actually in its full glory, bouncing between several different people in ninja costumes, um, some of, some of which are are of differing uh, differing accents. It was a delight, uh, by the way, that as well. I love awkward uh, choices in in dialectics and things, um, a la uh, Cannibal the Musical. So it's just a lot of fun. I loved it. The action is actually good. The choreography is pretty good. Um, I want to say too, so this movie was actually done after Brendan Steer made a, a grindhouse trailer for it. It was done as a trailer project uh, and then decided to make the full feature um, years later. Uh, so the the trailer was made while he was in film school in 2010. So this is, you know, came out eight years later, but it's really fun to see that kind of progression because I hope it encourages people like, like the films we release that the great filmmakers, all a lot of the films we talk about and cover here and urge you to, to watch and explore. They're done by people who frankly just do it right. They just do the movie. It's a huge commitment. Even if you're just making a movie with your phone, it takes time, it takes energy, but it can be done. So when I see something like this, where, you know, Steer is in film school, it's 2010, he does a goofy uh, trailer uh, and uh, for a fa you know, fake trailer for a movie, for a movie that doesn't yet exist and puts it online and it goes viral. And years later, like many years later, he makes a feature out of it. That's pretty darn good. It wasn't rushed. It was, as you said, Greg, it's a, clearly a passion project without being a um, vanity project, right? So that was really cool. I just can't get over, like, I can't ex stress enough how nice it is to see a movie that is a cult movie, but also easy to watch. Because something that we often struggle with in, in the cult and independent film world is difficult to watch movies, not because of the content, but because of the technical uh, aspects, right? If the sound is hard to hear, um, I mean, we put up with a lot and you can kind of get used to it. The more you watch a film and you fall into the, the film's uh, majesty or s under its spell, etc. But this is an easy to hear, attractively filmed, well acted and comedically uh, uh, intelligent. Like it's intelligent of comedy. Like it is, it understands comedy. So jokes aren't botched. There's different kind, levels of jokes. There are jokes that are just a funny situation. There are jokes that are actually like a punchline joke. There are uh, sight gags. It really, it doesn't tire you out. For example, like an episode of Gilmore Girls. I actually think they're they're brilliantly written. Um, but one, they're not realistic at all. We know that, that's fine. But the kind of humor is all through dialogue, right? It is the same kind of joke and the same... Uh, medium of joke delivery for every single thing this movie does not bore you because it does not fall into that category it does a lot of different ones so i think we can probably say if we were to look at exorcist 2 uh which is about a priest a priest um falling uh, victim to the the offerings of evil and the velocipastor we can see that they are in no way related uh not even close 
except for the fact that they both have priests who at some point uh, are in danger. And that is exactly what we do here at Cult and Classic Films. We compare, uh, we talk about two films, and really we never compare them because they are two completely different films just with one similar through line. And I hope you've figured that out by now since we are in episode 170 something, plus a bunch of extra bonus episodes. Uh, I, I love this movie. Mandy, are there any standout moments where you just like, this is the best thing of this movie. It can't top this. Like, I don't know. Like, I was just tickled big by the the scene where he, like, is in the confessional booth. And, like, the guy comes in. And <laughs> he, the like, pimp. goes, like, partial raptor and, like, punches through the screen. Like, falls him. I, I don't know why that scene in particular was my favorite. But I found it extra hilarious. <laughs> Can we can we talk about so that scene? Uh, it's the, the scene is this pimp comes in, and he goes in. I yeah, guess to confess. Whole, I guess, I'm like the whole pimp character is ridiculous and oh, amazing. He's super, what is his name? He has like a really goofy so, something mermaid because he's swimming in bitches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Um, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Frankie Mermaid. That's what it is. Frankie Mermaid. And I he it's a delight because he delivers, he chews the scenery, and he's only in a very small part of the film. But he's the first person, I believe, that uh the character of Doug kills, right? He 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 finds out in confessional that uh Frankie the Mermaid or Frankie Mermaid killed he caught he put in the bomb or had the bomb put in that killed uh, Doug's parents. Now I yeah. still am lost on the connection between the the parents and then the ninjas actually want to they want to cause terror and kill people because it will spread christianity in like some insanely convoluted way which is wild because doug goes to china because his mentor pastor tells him go somewhere you think god won't follow you and he's like aha china Try and <laughs> I know. <laughs> Which I don't like 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 unpack that as you will, but like yes. like yeah, the 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 villain's um trajectory is wild. I mean, without you know, with with the big spoiler of one of the henchmen is in fact Doug's brother. Which has not it's not even a spoiler yeah. because it's never even intimated in the whole movie. Although the reveal oh, is like, brilliant. Wait, what? The reveal yeah. is brilliant. The way that, I mean, they have this character appear in scenes in ways that you just didn't see him off camera. Like, it's really smart. Um, and it's well done. And it's just kind of, and also, I kind of like that our character, our lead, his biggest problem with this whole scenario is that he's befriended a prostitute, a sex worker, I should say, mm -hmm. and not the fact that he's killing people as a as a giant dinosaur. Um, or rather Come medium on. sized dinosaurs. You know the hierarchy well, of sins, right? Well, yeah. like, oh, sorry, Mandy. I was say it's far worse, you know. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. Just I was like, how American? Cold. The violence is okay, <laughs> but the, very, the, yeah. the, the sex work is, like, is it's, just... It's, yeah, no. Like, right now, obviously. Like, yeah. I mean, he does have to grapple with the fact that dinosaurs are real, which he... <laughs> Makes a point of dinosaurs are not real, therefore I could not have become a raptor. Yes, I do love that. Which, by the way, for those listening, um, I know we have a lot of people of different faiths or or lack of faiths or all sorts of things. Um, if you're not aware, there are, uh, I guess I'll say sex, but also areas of of thought in Christianity that do not believe dinosaurs existed. Uh, or if they do, they believe that the timeline is wrong and dinosaurs existed with man, all of the caveman cartoons, because Flintstones is fact. Uh, it is in the book of Revelations. And, Revelation, pardon. And uh, yeah, no, it, there are actually people that, that argue that there were no dinosaurs. And one of the key arguments against this is that, um, well, yes, there were bones, but they were put there by God to test faith. So this movie really rips that and just, just makes it a hilarious moment, as you said. Like at one point, Father Stewart comes in, and it's after he's been, you know, he's cha uh, Doug has changed into a raptor and kills people, whatever. He's in there and he's reading like a book, and it's like dinosaurs, and like he has to cut, like he covers it up. <laughs> it's just this, <laughs> it's this very bonkers um, 
bonkers moment. And for listeners, you know, we're out here in the desert near Palm Springs. Anybody that's seen the Cabazon uh, dinosaurs, they're two very large dinosaurs that are out here. They're kind of probably most well known. They've been in tons of movies, but for um, Pee Wee's Big Top, like I believe that was the Pee Wee movie. I can't even remember. They blur together for me. I've seen them so many times, but that's the movie that they're in uh, as the most famous one. And that actually, it used to be the dinosaurs. And then like there was like a little. I don't even know a shop kind of set up with a bunch of dinosaur things. You could go and buy snacks or whatever. Uh, it was purchased some years ago by, I think the current owners, which are actually creationists, which is those that believe that uh, God created everything. Generally, they believe it was in a very short timeline, I think 4,000 years or something. Um, and so it's hilarious because they, they bought a land with two giant landmark dinosaurs that you can actually climb into and look out little windows. And then they bought the, the, you know, they got the adjoining property at which point they made it a creationist museum. So you have dinosaurs bringing people into a creationist museum. It's kind of this really insane um, marketing strategy. It's like, uh, it's like if you'd advertise. Also have giant dinosaurs all over one in like, Ohio or Kentucky, where they built like the Ark. Like oh, Bill yeah, and I the, went the... and like did like a like a, a thing, like a debate with that dude. Yeah, like yes. another creationist museum. Yes, that was uh but they that have was... dinosaurs outside. Yes, they do. That is that is a you I've can been, look that I've up. been to the outside of that museum because there was um some business travel I used to do in that area. That's hilarious. Yeah, no, it's that that is a well known. I think it's they. I can't remember if they call it the the Ark of the Americas or the American Ark or something. It's supposed to be a recreation of Noah's actual ship that he saved. You know what? Go 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 read the Bible. You know, you have some you have some fun. It's um far more violent and there's far more sex workers in the Bible than there are in Velocipaster and the Exorcist to the Heretic put together. Uh, so you know you'd have to get to like Velocipaster part thirty seven before you even get through. You know um. The, the the old testament okay so philosopher really funny do not understand the the villain's ultimate end game uh doesn't matter the the violence is pretty great one thing i'll say is that they do it's very much a the second half is very much a classic 80s action movie set up like plot because the the lead character is sort of impervious to damage yet everyone around him gets either killed or maimed uh and it's sort of you know it's 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 the the masculine like everybody has to be fridged but 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 him because that's the only way he can be a man is if he's standing on his own and revenging himself upon other people and and so it has that but it's so tongue-in-cheek that it's clearly intentional right like it's we know that it's so ridiculous that it doesn't actually feel like some weird misogynistic gesture in in what what dangerous masculinity is and uh and also the spoiler alert the uh the female companion lives in the end does anybody actually remember the final scene of this movie cuz i don't they, like dressed in leather jackets like going off like on like a new adventure are they both the world, i can't even remember like, or is... Was it I like, like to the pretend whole... it was the uh the gandhi quote even though i know that's not it oh my god the gandhi quote that was that was at the beginning. I just correct? remember him like in like a leather jacket. At the end yeah, he has like, a leather jacket. In my brain, so this is so funny. Part. I mean, we'll just watch this. In my brain, <laughs> it is, it is the end of um, uh, of of the common writer Zio, which we watched recently. Like he just gets on a motorcycle, says something cool, like "I gotta be me," and like drives off into the sunset. And I think it's sort of like that, but I can't really remember. And I think they're together. Um, but again. Sure. It's it's just a send off. It's just to say one thing. She survived. Here's a funny button out the door. Um, I want to mention too, the music is kind of awesome in this movie. Uh, there's a song in here by Math the Band, M A T H the Band, which is like this math rocky band. They're phenomenal. They've gone through a bunch of different members, but uh, look them up, find them on SoundCloud. Although I don't know how much money they even get from that, but probably more than Spotify, right? Uh, you can catch them live. You can get physical releases from them at their shows, but not online it seems because i've tried so math the band hit us up we'll 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 buy your we'll buy your shit so yeah there's some really good some good music in here the soundtrack which i believe is also available for purchase is is pretty 
pretty rock solid, uh, which is not something I say often on this podcast. I, I think Tad would agree, who's not here today, uh, that most of usually... the movies we watch don't have a soundtrack. Right, right. Like Soundtracks cost money, Or we like money, comment on the Mandy. fact that they have like a song. Like, yeah, that they use over and over again, yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say, and, uh, except that it's a good soundtrack. This movie has like a really, there's two movies that I thought of the whole time I was watching this. So cult film fans who, who watched a lot of movies, listen up, because I think, I want to hear from you, because I think this is accurate. The first movie that this reminded me of 100% is Miami Connection. Miami Connection has everything, ninjas, other martial artists, um, friends that live together and are in a rock band together and no martial arts together, and they fight ninjas. I'm like, so it's it's very much Velocipaster is is a concept of that, but you take out the, the band element and you add in uh, uh, Christianity and a dinosaur. Uh, but it's very much that vibe. Like it's played serious, but it's completely un it's completely not the real world. It's so bonkers. And then the other one is uh, the film Future War with Daniel Bernhard and <laughs> uh, Robert Zadar. And that one is about, uh, for those who don't know the name, Daniel Bernhardt is like, he always has been the, the premier Jean-Claude Van Damme replacement. He looks incredibly similar. If you saw a picture of them at the same age, I mean, it, you would be hard pressed to not think they're the same person. Uh, so he ended up always getting the, the low budget sequels to Van Damme's movies. Like he was in Bloodsport parts million through or whatever. Uh, and He's, he's a great action actor, but he's in Future War, at which point this guy from the future escapes uh, back to Earth through, I don't know, it's a time machine or it's just space, whatever. Maybe it's just from space. Uh, but he gets to Earth. He uh, befriends a sex worker. And together, they fight against this alien menace who has enslaved space mankind through controlling dinosaurs, i.e., a velociraptor, maybe an allosaur, uh, allosaurus. So it's very, there's, there's very many parallels to that movie. And it makes me think that uh, Brendan Steer saw that, especially because that movie was featured in a late season episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000. So definitely check those out if you have seen Velocipaster uh, or, or you hope you watch it after this if you haven't. And then if you, if you want to kind of get more of the vibe, watch Future War feel free to pick up the Mystery Science Theater episode version. It's hilarious. And then also you can watch Miami Connection, which is amazing both by itself, but also Riff Tracks, the people from the last later seasons of uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, they did Miami Connection. They did a live version, which was streamed to theaters uh, nationwide. And they also did a studio recorded one, but it's very funny. And it actually has the, uh, the support and okay of the star who is a... a excellent well-known martial artist in his own right so again let's move on to the recommendations uh, i've prattled on enough i'll start i recommend Velocipaster to a lot of people uh it is going to be mana from the gods to cult lovers who just want something ridiculous uh, because it's not just ridiculous it's actually very watchable and well produced and for people who don't really have a, a great investment in cult film, first off, I don't know why you're listening to this. I'm glad you are. I hope we're expanding your horizons. But you can watch Pastor because it's genuinely a funny comedy. It's a spoof on action movies. Um, it's a spoof on, frankly, a lot of other sort of, you know, Z-grade movies that uh, have been pumped out for the last decade plus, right? Like, uh, Sharktopus, although I like Sharktopus, Sharktopus, um, uh, Sharknado part 30,000, like the, Sharknado is very much trying to go for the same vibe. Um, and while I think there's fun to be had there, Velocipaster really nails it. Uh, it feels like, as Greg said, it feels like a theater released film, a smaller film, but a theater released comedy based on the concept of a cheesy movie plots. So I recommend it. Greg, would you recommend Velocipaster from 2018? If so, why and to who? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd recommend it pretty much to anyone. Um, it's it's well paced, it's funny, it's it's well made. It, um, I would specifically, I was thinking of what is it, Kung Fury, 
yeah. that like kind of wild ass again like indie style film if 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 you loved kung fury and you wish that it had a plot that's Velocipaster. like Velocipaster, yes, i think is fair. just as wild but brought together with a narrative um or like you know bigger more mainstream ones like um kung pao enter the fist um kung fu hustle like it's just that same vibe of there's there's a story going on here and it's and it's and it it's not just a vehicle for the silliness it is mm-hmm. in a way but like the plot actually does make sense you can follow it like you said it's easy watching while yeah. still being very very funny i i couldn't agree more mandy would you recommend Velocipass from 2018 if so why and to who yes i would recommend this and i recommended it to the members of the pod <laughs> yes yes she did in fact you were the, you were the biggest driving force and then uh and then you guys you're recommending it to everybody else because i was right because it's amazing it uh, is. so you should watch this movie and have a blast and then also go out and get yourself your own little velociraptor gloves so you can terrorize your family totally great time totally in fact you can get some pretty close claw gloves right now in the toy section at target and every other uh, you know, sort of catch-all store right now uh, from from the Jurassic Park toy line series. In fact, I think Target even has some on clearance that are pretty fun. And you can, you know, uh, confuse people when you're driving down the road and and you wave at them with uh, with raptor claws. So thank you all for listening to Cult and Classic Films podcast. Please go ahead and go to patreon.com slash cult and classic films and check out what we have. You can sign up for a very low cost monthly to get exclusive cult movies sent directly to your door. These are uh, these are high quality um, Blu-ray uh, transfers or upscales, uh, 1080 PI, DPI, whatever. 1080, 1080 resolution. It's really nice. We update everything. We use, uh, we even use AI, thanks Skynet, uh, to do some some remastering. So you'll get the films, which one, you probably didn't know existed and couldn't find elsewhere. But two, our versions are exclusive. They're the best versions you can find of these films and they have tons of extras. Our first two releases are out now and they're both double features. So you really can't go wrong. And we're talking cheap. Like you can get a movie a month for $20. And again, they're exclusive to us. You won't find them uh in this way anywhere else so do that you can also buy them a la carte for a little bit more about five dollars more a piece at cultandclassicfilms.com so make sure you do that at least check it out share it with friends that you think will enjoy it and you can sign up for our mailing list at cultandclassicfilms.com too which uh, is where we'll share a lot of upcoming stuff so thank you all so much to play us out as the chud and i want to say be kind be safe and stay weird <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for listening to Cult and Classic Podcast. This podcast is important to me. What's more important are the rights, privileges, and freedom from violence of everyone in this country and in this world. And that means supporting Black Lives Matter. If you'd like to make a donation, please go ahead and visit cultandclassicpodcast.com where we have a list of places you can donate and help out. And please stay safe.